Good morning, and thank you for joining us here at I-24 News Morning Edition. We begin with our top story. The U.S. expressed its support of the new Palestinian unity government after the EU and other superpowers, such as China, Russia, and India, were quick to do the same. This overwhelming support comes as a blow for Israel, as Netanyahu had relentlessly urged the international community to break ties with the new Palestinian government over its unity with Hamas. Echoing disappointment, Israel issued new tenders for more than 3,000 housing units in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, and this decision was followed by Australia's surprising announcement yesterday that it refuses to recognize East Jerusalem as an occupied territory. Does the shift in Australian foreign policy bring any comfort to the Israeli government, which is also set to vote next week on a controversial nationality bill? To hear more about these diplomatic disputes, we're joined in studio by the former Deputy Foreign Minister of Israel and the founder of The Truth About Israel, NPO, Ambassador Dani Ayolon. Thank you for joining us, Ambassador. Thank you. And also by I-24 News diplomatic correspondent, Tal Shlev. Good morning, Tal. Good morning. Let's take a look at your report uh, from last night. It was a train wreck waiting to happen. Just a few days after the establishment of the new Palestinian unity government, tensions between Jerusalem, Ramallah and Washington threatened to reach a new high. Israel announces massive settlement construction, the Palestinians vow to retaliate, and the Obama administration is engaged in a harsh war of words with the Israeli government. Israel is deeply disappointed with the comments yesterday from the U.S. State Department that the United States will work with the new Palestinian government backed by Hamas. Just a few days ago, Netanyahu was confident that the world would stand by his side in his objection to the new Fatah Hamas government. But then the U.S. surprised him. Based on what we know now about the composition of this technocratic government, which has no ministers affiliated with Hamas and is committed to the principles that I described, we will work with it as we need to as is appropriate. Others were soon to follow Washington's lead, and within hours, recognition greetings arrived in Ramallah from all over the world, from the United Nations to the European Union to Moscow and Beijing. Israel then decided to respond with a, quote, proper Zionist reaction, announcing permits for 3,300 new housing units in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. The international condemnations are already pouring in, so instead of the anticipated pressure on Ramallah's cooperation with the Hamas terror group, Jerusalem's settlement policies are now once again in the line of fire. As usual, the most disturbing winds are coming from the White House in the umpteenth confrontation between the Obama administration and Netanyahu's government. The international reaction to the new unity government is a resounding failure of Netanyahu's government. As the Palestinian government wraps up its first week, Abbas can score one major point. Instead of isolating the Palestinians, Netanyahu found himself alone on the hill. Tal, so of course, uh, Jerusalem is furious with the uh, criticisms around the world, not only from the United States. Now the EU has also condemned uh, the new building tenders uh, quite controversially, we have to say. Well, yes. Um, Interesting to look at the language, uh, just the language games uh, in the world in the past uh, week. Um, the EU and the United States both used uh, the terms deeply disappointed mm -hmm. uh, yesterday when they referred to the uh, uh, massive construction plans that Israel published. And this is, of course, a reference to Israel's own language when it talked about deeply disappointed. But I think, mm -hmm. in my point of view, what actually happened is a kind of a poof moment, like uh, the U.S. Secretary of State Kerry uh, described uh, just a few uh, weeks ago. Um, there was a crisis, and it was a crisis between Israel and the U.S. and Israel and the international community, and Israel was very disappointed and very troubled by the lack of communication from the administration and, and uh, from the uh, overwhelming support that the new Palestinian government was getting. But then came the settlement announcement, and poof, the, to the, the story to uh, turned uh, all around, and right. now the disappointment is with Israel instead with the Hamas. So this is, uh, um, this is the latest uh, development, and it, it's probably just going to get worse in the upcoming days because Israel, of course, is not happy with the condemnations. Israeli officials last night were briefing against the EU. How does the EU uh, support, does not even have one bad word, one critical word to say about Hamas, a terror group, and uh, has all these words, uh, bad words to talk about our unilateral moves. So uh, it's still tense, and I think it's going to continue to be this way. Meaning, Ambassador Ayalon, this roller coaster, if we can uh, go through a Tal's analogy here, could it have been stopped or changed its course differently had Israel acted differently diplomatically? 
Well, I think this is, we need a, uh, some uh, responsible adult here. And this is uh, in reference to the entire uh, international community. I think there was overreaction, first of all, by Europe actually embracing a Hamas government, uh, not mentioning its uh, red lines and the principles, the mm -hmm. quartet principles. Uh, the Americans also not really being in uh, complete uh, transparency and coordination with Israel and of course Israel is feeling uh, in the corner and also uh, overreacting. Um, I think what we need today is responsibility, consultation and cooling things down because right now it seems like we're going on a slippery slope. But could the Prime Minister Netanyahu have acted differently? Perhaps, as you say, the U.S. was not acting transparently, but that's because it goes further back. The U.S.-Israeli ties have not been that strong. They've been shaky for a while now. Well, probably it could have, and uh, in hindsight, always it's uh, easier mm -hmm. to observe. But uh, I believe that uh, the Israeli position could have been more nuanced. Uh, by that, I'm, ma I'm meaning instead of rejecting um, right at hand uh, the development, the political development in the Palestinians, I think Israel could have stressed that uh, the quartet uh, principles should be accepted by this new uh, government or by uh, the Hamas as a condition mm -hmm. to moving forward. This mean, was not done. mean changing the rhetoric, may adapting perhaps the rhetoric to international standards, what Netanyahu didn't do. Which is actually no change of Israel's policy all right. along. It was the same uh, thing with the PLO. PLO, there was, wasn't a legitimate uh, interlocutor until they uh, recognized Israel's right to exist. The same thing is with Hamas. So instead of putting all the uh, focus and attention on Israel, should have been put on Hamas and Abbas and the Palestinian government for accepting, pressure for accepting the quartet's uh, principles. And abiding, of course, by international rules. Uh, is Israel today isolated? That's the biggest question, I think, that uh, policymakers around the world are looking at. And that's the biggest fear, of course, of Israelis. Every time we, we take a uh, look at our situation right now and we have to reevaluate, are we actually isolating ourselves? Of course, we take great comfort about the new recognition or the new definition of the Australian government, right. a very friendly government about uh, Jerusalem or East Jerusalem. But uh, this is just uh, too little, maybe even uh, too late. Yes, if I have to give you the short answer, Yael, Israel today is quite isolated. Tala, speaking about the Australian government, uh, what were the reactions in Jerusalem? Was it a surprise for Jerusalem? And can other countries uh, perhaps follow suit? Well, uh, it wasn't a surprise in Jerusalem. This, it's a gradual policy shift in, since uh, the Liberal Party took, uh, po took power in uh, Australia. It's a gradual policy shift. And uh, let's begin with Australia is a very friendly uh, country to Israel. Historically, there's a strong Jewish community, mm -hmm. very influential Jewish community. And uh, um, I've been to several visits to Australia. It really is uh, um, like maybe the Pacific equivalent of Canada in this point of view. Very uh, warm and very embracing to Israeli policy. But yes, since the Liberal Party took office, they have been gr gradually shifting more and more pro-Israeli and less and less pro-Palestinian. This has to do also with uh, um, their discontent with uh, some of the Palestinian moves, but um, mainly because the liberal power, uh, the liberal party committed to restore mm -hmm. um, the relationship with uh, with Israel when it took power. It's uh, part of a criticism. They believe, like Canada, that criticism should be indoors between friends and not outspoken. And this is why they decide uh, they decided on this uh, new policy shift. Um, but is it, this it, is a, it, it is a game changer, isn't it? By by putting down occupied out of East Jerusalem, it's changing completely the rhetoric. I don't think it's a game changer. With all my due respect to Australia, and Australia is an is a very uh, gracious and mm -hmm. fabulous country. Um, this is not a game changer because she it's um, it's not a she's not a major player. It's not a major player in the international arena. It's like Canada. Um, it's important to have voices like this. It's important to understand the rhetoric, and they do have a point, which from Israel, I think Israel can use this, the, the uh, Australian point and the Australian explanations and try and promote it. They do say this is not, um, it's not our government's uh, job to define legal uh, implications or legal, uh, um, legal terms of the conflict. These are things that should be um, defined in uh, uh, negotiations. And I think there is a nice logic to that, which Israeli government officials would, are happy to, uh, to spread around the world. Will that happen? I'm not so sure. Uh, of course, maybe Canada, maybe next, if uh, we, we go through that logic. Uh, ambassador Dan Shapiro, uh, the ambassador, uh, the United States ambassador here in Israel, said yesterday that Israel was doing business as usual with the Palestinian government. Hence, 
why are we getting uh, all, uh, you know, riled up because of the United States' recognition that it's, it's, you know, eye for an eye? Well, it is true because Israel has, in that respect, some untenable position. On the one hand, they want to boycott the Hamas uh, government, but at the same time, they continue with the security cooperation, of course, and also continue with transferring of uh, funds. So in that respect, um, Ambassador Shapiro is right. But uh, what should have been pointed out is the expectations for the future. Right now, um, I think Israel uh, government is right to continue uh, with uh, business as usual on the ground, but not business as usual as it comes to the rhetoric and it mm -hmm. comes to the position in the future. And this is the major difference between the Israeli government and the international community. Well, uh, of course, uh, Ambassador Shapiro did say this in order to show Israel that we're not doing anything wrong. We're merely abiding by rules as, uh, as you are as yourselves. Is, is, is this just abiding by rules or is this a change in U.S. foreign policy? It's, I'm not sure it's a major change, but it certainly it uh, shows a lack of intimacy and lack of trust mm -hmm. in the highest uh, echelons of government. And this is one of the main problems that we have. No consultations, surprises by all sides, and this is not really uh, a conduct of uh, good policies, and it doesn't really bode well for everybody's objective here to continue a peace process, to try to achieve a peaceful solution. So I would say everybody is here wrong, the Europeans, the Americans and, and the also the Israeli government. And the Israelis. And of course, first and foremost, is uh, we have to say, is the Hamas. This is the main problem, right. that they keep uh, their uh, terror. They, they do not renounce terrorism. They do not abide by uh, former uh, agreements with Israel. And certainly, they do not recognize Israel. And of course, uh, the U.S.-Israeli ties has always been something, especially since uh, the Obama-Netanyahu uh, click, if we can say it that way, uh, hasn't seemed to be working from the beginning, but we've always reevaluated the ties. Are the ties now actually strained? Because we always hear from the Americans, Israel is our, our strongest ally, where security arrangements are on the table as usual, business as usual. Is this now actually a strain on the ties? Well, we have to distinguish between personal relationship and also uh, the country to country. This overall strategic relations, which really encompass so many fields, whether it's intelligence, uh, strategy, uh, defense, uh, economic, many, many other things are uh, untouched, and it's uh, to the benefit of both countries. But uh, when it comes to uh, political coordination and the trust at the top, I think it is quite strained. Um, I uh, just want to add, I think that the past year, um, at, opposed to the first Obama mm -hmm. administration, there was a personal tension. It was clear. Everyone knew. Um, but there was it was under control. Maybe uh, we can discuss. Uh, maybe there was a, a grown-up in charge that's not there anymore in the Israeli government. But uh, that's a different discussion. But in the past year, it's really deteriorated. We've had the bad deal. We've had Newsweek. We've had uh, uh, the obsessive and messianic. We've had the apartheid comments. There's not a month go that goes by without uh, a big public rift between Israel and the U.S. From both sides. From both sides, but the rhetoric that comes from the Israeli government and from senior ministers in the Israeli government, the way they allow themselves to speak about the U.S. and the greatest ally and the criticism, I think that um, it, it's passed. Uh, it's passed some some good lines, some border lines. Um, I'm not sure that it does not affect. It will not affect in the end. It will affect some of Israel's strategic interests, as it does in Germany, which uh, um, which is also a very good friend of Israel and the settlement policies are starting to undermine the relationship, really, and you can see it on the ground. It can happen to the United States if it's not stopped. And as you said, the lack of communication. There is no communication. And you can how public um, most of the, uh, um, the message exchanging is public. It's through briefings. It's, it's through uh, uh, sta um, press conferences. Right. And what's going on behind the closed doors? Not a lot. I think everybody is waiting for the uh, midterm elections in November. Mm -hmm. If in the midterm elections we will see a defeat, a political defeat for the president and his party, uh, then things may get into a real long limbo of um, paralysis. Uh, on the other hand, if we will see that the Democrats continue to retain the Senate, I believe that we may see more bold ideas from Kerry and the president here. And quickly, of course, uh, going through what Tala said uh, before about Netanyahu is perhaps succumbing to internal pressure within his own government and acting in certain ways. Would you say that many of his moves are because of, are because of internal pressure within his own coalition? We saw, of course, uh, the opposition leader, Bougie Herzog, calling for complete different policies. 
Right. Well, I'm not sure that this is the whole story. I believe that Netanyahu ideologically uh, really uh, has his own principles and he abides mostly mm -hmm. by them. And this is the first line. Only because of this ideology, he preferred the government that he has today. Okay, Ambassador Danny Island, thank you for joining us today. Thank and Tal Shalev, I-24 News diplomatic correspondent, you're off to Rome. Perhaps that will uh, see some, bear some fruit uh, for the stalemate in the peace process? Well, yes, Sunday, uh, um, the Israeli president and the Palestinian president will be giving a joint prayer for peace, uh, uh, invitation of the Pope, uh, of Pope Francis. I think it's more interesting to see how the Israeli prime minister and government will react to that meeting um, than, the, than the prayer itself. Right. So in internal politics maybe are trumping uh, diplomacy right now. Tal Shalev, thank you for joining us. After the break, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's very own Bible studies group and other behind-the-scenes treats in our weekly mix of politics and Instagram. But first, some more of this morning's headlines. Welcome back to I-24 News Morning Edition. Well, we're welcoming now our one and only Anthony Grant, who joins us daily to discuss the news that you may have missed while scanning the newspaper headlines this morning. Anthony Grant. Well, welcome. Welcome to and you. Good morning. Good morning yeah. on this very fine day. Yes. It came fine. Yes, yes. The weather can change fast in the region. It can. As it can anywhere. But, you know, this is a big momentous day uh, because of the 70th anniversary of, of D-Day. And world leaders, of course, are gathering along with veterans in France. And um, a lot of the headlines in the British papers, for example, are reflecting this uh, momentous anniversary, such as the Express which talks about how D-Day veterans pilgrimage of honor 70 years on and salute to the fallen. Mm -hmm. uh, picture of Prince Charles there, who was uh, one of the first to arrive for um, some of these uh, commemorative events. Right. And 70 years on. Wow. And, and that generation is uh, slowly... Uh... There are still, um, you know, obviously there are still people that, uh, veterans that, that fought that, uh, you know, fewer and fewer. But, uh, of course, um, their tales and the details that emerge from those are, uh, you know, not, you know, part of historical, you know, record, really. Indeed. So... Well, to add a personal touch to D-Day's 70th anniversary, we're now joined via Skype by your father, Anthony, Dr. Alan Lechman from Palm Springs, California. Dr. Lechman, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Glad to be here. We're, uh, we're interested, of course, in hearing uh, some of your own family history regarding the famous landings on D-Day 70 years ago. Uh, your father was uh, one such soldier. Yes, he was. Indeed, he was. He landed at uh, Utah Beach. And uh, I believe he was in what he called the third wave. And he told me uh, many times that if he had been in the first wave or if he had landed at Omaha Beach, mm -hmm. I would probably be an only child because it was very, very rough there, as you can imagine. And you yourself went back to see, of course, uh, where they landed. And, and what was your perception as, as the second generation? Well, I uh, went back actually with both of my sons at the 60th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And we really spent some time on the beaches. And you become amazed at what they accomplished because they were basically targets. And it was amazing to see the vast expanse of beach that these men had to traverse and actually establish a beachhead. It's almost incomprehensible when you look at it that way. And when you were growing up, was this, uh, were stories told from, uh, from D-Day, or was it something that really wasn't spoken about, uh, something that perhaps was very tra tragic and traumatic, and, and thus wasn't really uh, on the open? Yes, you know, many men were like my father. They didn't like to discuss the actual events because some, as you can well imagine, were horrific. And it was not something they wanted to talk about because then it would force them to remember. And they just wanted to remember other things, didn't want to talk about the actual events that occurred. But uh, uh, they did talk about a few things, a few battles that they won, some that they lost, uh, 
My father proceeded on for a month to go to uh, St. Lowe, where there was a major battle fought, mm -hmm. and it was a huge strategic win for the United States at that point. And that's where my father was wounded. A question now from your son here in, in uh, studio, Anthony. I'm just. Uh, do you have any uh, of um, of High's relics uh, that were that he maybe uh, gave to you after uh, just to hand to hand down to you to keep for posterity? Sure, if I can be allowed to change the camera around, I can show you. Well, uh, if you look up here, you can see a helmet. Uh, and if you look closely, you can see some of the dents and the tearing and the uh, camouflage netting. Indeed. And his purple heart. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Mm. And it's actually in there, but it's a little hard to open it up with one hand. But uh, yes. And then if you go back a little bit, I have a whole corner dedicated. And I thought when I first saw this poster, I might actually see my father in it, but of course I don't. But this is exactly what it looked like when they landed at Utah. Wow. Well, Dr. Luckman, thank you for joining us uh, from Palm Springs, California, 70 years, of course, since uh, D-Day. And, and thank you uh, for sharing with us uh, Anthony Grant here in studio. Thank you. You're very welcome. Glad to be here. Wow, Anthony, uh, what, a, what a family history, yeah. but we're going to have to go quickly to the next yeah, uh, headline. Okay, very quickly. Um, uh, the Australian uh, coalition rules out occupied to describe Israeli East Jerusalem settlements. Right. We've talked about that. So moving on to something a little bit uh, more, um, let's see, different note. The Daily Star in Beirut reports that um, Russia has praised the Syrian election as free and fair. Oh, well, I mean, th thank God for Russia. On a lighter note, right? Because well, we all were um, so convinced of that. So. And, and <laughs> n n no one like Russia to make me even more convinced. Exactly. Okay. Uh, but, you know, they're saying, listen, um, maybe it was a difficult election given the uh, events on the ground, but the part that was actually um, electoral related was, was, was unmarred by, uh, by um, how shall I put it, by, by legitimacy. They're saying it was legitimately done, the part that was uh, monitored by them. All right. Others, well, so. well, we won't argue with that right now. Not right now. Later we will. N maybe. Um, <laughs> Al Arabiya has sort of a side note to the election in Egypt, saying Adli Mansour is the first Egyptian president to enjoy a safe exit. Meaning he's not in a cage. Not in a cage, and he was the f apparently the first uh, modern Egyptian head of state to leave office alive or without oh. engendering an uprising. Oh, wow. So that's kind of an accomplishment. And he you stepped, know? I mean, well, he <laughs> stepped down. He also is uh, accepting the election results. Yeah, yeah. That so helps. it's sort of, it does help. <laughs> yeah. So a little bit of calm in the Egyptian storm. For now. Um, creating and uh, uh, ruffling other feathers, of course, is uh, Nigel Farage, mm -hmm. if I'm pronouncing it right, from the United Kingdom Independent Party. UKIP. Who, UKIP. Yeah. who says that uh, in this editorial piece in the Telegraph that Greece has been sacrificed on the altar of the failed Euro experiment. Oh. He says that an IMF report is proving that British taxpayers' money was used to back a coup, as he describes it, against the Greek people. Wow. Strong that, language. Strong language against the EU. Very much so. Very much so. That's, One that to was watch. his campaign, uh, and he did well. In he did. So he's 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 keep he's so uh, he has an audience going off on that same uh, uh, theme of against the EU as we're seeing. Um, interesting story from Kenya. Uh, the Daily Nation, a big newspaper down there, reports that United Kingdom troops are going to be training with the Kenya Wildlife Service to fight elephant poaching. Oh, good. This is, of course, a huge issue oh, in Kenya. What a picture. Uh, it's a horrible picture. Um, Seventy-one elephants have been killed in Kenya since the beginning of the year. And, uh, of course, these are an endangered species. And United Kingdom troops, you know, they are going to be working on anti-ambush techniques um, with the uh, Wildlife Service authorities in Kenya to help combat the poaching. Wow. And uh, Daily Mail has reported that some poaching is being done by al-Qaeda al elements to fund terrorist activities, reportedly. Wow. It's just a is messy situation. Ivory and uh, mm. illicit trade in that in China, of course, is still something that is... Um, very much Garnering something in money. play, yeah. unfortunately. Um, do we have time for some Hillary Clinton news? Qu well, um, I can't say no to Hillary Clinton. I didn't think you could. <laughs> the, the Washington Free Beacon reports that Hillary, according to them, to the New York Times, is set to back off. Apparently, wow. some of Hillary's closest um, assistants had a meeting with the New York Times' Washington Bureau saying yeah. that they're, they're treating her too roughly and that because she's no longer a public figure, she shouldn't have as much close public uh, scrutiny as an actual someone who's in office. Right. And um, the New York Times has no comment about this alleged meeting, which might tell you that it did probably actually take place. Well, Possibly. I mean, her, her, the meeting did include her close advisors and so forth. 
But she she prefers people now. People she prefers understand. people. people. I mean, you know. <laughs> you know, people. She's fresh faced. You know, that's kind of the image that she. I think she's going for New right York now. Times but is too, you know, highbrow but, right now. We want to go for the People magazine. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, the New York Times. Uh, who knows? It's a uh, it's a candidate that they a potential candidate that you could see them backing. I think. Right. But they do ask a lot of hard questions. Indeed. Um, they also have an article, the New York Times, about Bill De Blasio, the mayor of New York, and it's a very easy article. They talk about how he works out. Right. In New York, it's very uh, sort of a, a puff piece, which you wouldn't normally expect in a paper like the Times, but there you go. Well, wow. de Blasio is doing well so far. Anthony Any Grant, thank you. And Tal Shalev is in studio with us, of course, with the beloved Instagram segment. We're waiting for it all week. What are you starting with? Well, uh, today we have a special inside look. It's not exactly Instagram, but if you look in my Instagram account, you'll find photos of it. Okay. Um, this week, uh, um, we went uh, to a special Bible club um, in the Prime Minister's residence. Um, let's take a look at the report, and then I can tell you a bit about the inside experience. Let's take a look. Jesus was here in this land and spoke Hebrew. Israel's Prime Minister astonished the world last week when he squabbled with Pope Francis over Jesus' mother tongue. It turns out they were both right. Jesus was a native Aramaic speaker, but he would have also known Hebrew. Not many leaders would attempt to challenge the Pope on the details of the Holy Scriptures, but Netanyahu, well, he knows his Old Testament. In our time, the biblical prophecies are being realized. As the prophet Amos said, historical allusions are an evident part of Netanyahu's political identity, and highlighting the Jewish people's 3,000 year connection to the land of Israel is one of his favorite themes. And I will plant them upon their soil, never to be uprooted again. Even though he wasn't raised in a religious home, Netanyahu has developed an increasing interest in studying the Bible in recent years, and in many ways, he practically married it. His wife, Sarah, was raised by a Bible scholar, and she and her siblings all competed in national and international Bible quizzes. The His TV. son, Avner, inherited the Bible business, and back in 2010, won the third place in the international Bible quiz. Every week I have a Bible lesson here with my own Bible teacher, our son, Avner, who is a real expert. <laughs> In the past two years, Netanyahu has expanded his Bible reading habits. Once every few months, a small group of distinguished Jewish scholars are invited to the official residence for a special Bible study group, and together they uncover the secrets of the Old Testament. This week, the topic was the Book of Ruth, and you can count on the Israeli Prime Minister that he always has questions and something to say. The Bible is the essence of our existence. If not the Bible, it would be somewhere else, or not be at all. Netanyahu isn't the first prime minister who has a special place in his heart for the Bible. The Torah study circle is a decades-old tradition from the days of former prime ministers David Ben-Gurion and Menachem Begin. It turns out that the Holy Scripture is the perfect refuge from the turbulent hardships of the Israeli premiership. So, Tal, of course, uh, this is B uh, Netanyahu's a hobby with his family, but it also may seep into his policies as well, right? It's a big question what comes what first. Comes first? Um, it's a big part of his politics. He uses it. This appeals, of course, to his political base, the uh, religious right, right. and uh, the people he's trying to draw into the Likud party from the uh, nationalist religious uh, circles. But there is also, and I've been to this uh, Bible Circle Club a few times, I think this was my fourth time in the past two years to, c I, I, to sit in this mm -hmm. Bible Club. First of all, and I admit, I have a, I have a soft space in my uh, heart for the Bible and for uh, the Jewish history and the ancient Jewish history. And it's a really intriguing conversation, what goes on there. It's really the best Jewish scholars of uh, today, of modern times, and they have very interesting uh, discussions. And you can sense Netanyahu is really, there is some passion. genuine cu curiosity yeah. and passion about the uh, Bible. And I think it's in, it's interesting because it is a very special, special, special book, and it's a special group of people talking about it. And I do think that in many ways he get he gets some uh, power. He finds right. some uh, inner power inside the Bible. And as we uh, said in the report, both uh, former prime ministers of Inben Gurion and Menachem Begin also had these kind of Bible circles. There is a secret 
to the Bible that it might be helping for the Jewish leaders or the leaders of the Jewish people, which have horrible times, and right. it's a very difficult well, job. Well, it definitely gives a lot of insight, that's for sure. Yes. What else uh, on the Instagram uh, radar? Well, today, uh, so this week, Netanyahu, uh, we're continuing with Netanyahu. This week, Netanyahu uh, posted this selfie. It's uh, um, him um, and his scouts, uh, with a scouts uh, group. Um, you can see his son, Avner, the Bible, the Bible whiz. Yeah. Um, he's uh, there in the middle. And this was the uh, graduation ceremony of his volunteering year in the scouts in Batyam. So Netanyahu went there and uh, posted this uh, beautiful photo and praised everyone who's volunteering. And with his son. With his son. Yeah. But now has a contender to the royal heir. Uh, Gidon Sal, the interior Ooh, minister. Look at that pic. That's a, what's one hell of a selfie. Well, yes. He had a son uh, earlier this year. And uh, um, since then, he's been kind of only posting photos of him and his son. It's the new Gidon Sar. It's, it's the, the new Gidon, Gidon Sar. Sar. And you know, he's building himself. He he uh, married the TV anchor Geula Cohen, his second, uh, Geula Evan, his second anchor. And uh, they're uh, um, building this whole kind of notion of a royal couple. Right. Netanyahu should be careful because David is uh, the next royal heir, heir and uh, Gidon Sal is definitely trying to promote it, at least on Instagram. Oh my God, and babies do sell. So, yeah. Netanyahu, get yourself a baby. That's what I have to say. Yes. <laughs> that seems like the only way I out. I think it's a bit too late, but. Um, <laughs> Let's quickly, pray. Quickly, very quickly. Okay, quickly, very quickly. First Lady Michelle Obama this week posted ah. this video. Let's hear it. Can we hear it? That's the result you're going to get. Wow. Where'd you learn how to do all this? You got to put the right fuel in your body in order to perform at your best. All right, sir, could you throw me a bottle of water, please? Oh, she's the all-around woman, huh? That's the Let's <laughs> Move campaign. This time the guest, uh, she already had the Miami Heat, so Miami Heat over. This time the, uh, the guest is uh, Richard Sherman, the uh, um, Super Bowl champion from nice. the Super Bowl champion uh, Seattle Cooking Seahawks. Cooking salmon. Cooking salmon. <laughs> nice. With That's uh, bon delicious. Appetit. Bon appetit. Tal Shalev, thank you. Next up are the headlines. Welcome back. It's still Friday, June 6, 2014. This is still the morning edition here on I-24 News. I'm Yael Wisner-Levy. Thank you for staying with us. The Eco Cinema is an international environmental film festival taking place right here in the Jaffa Port this weekend. One of the most intriguing films screening at this year's festival is Blackfish. It's the tale of Tilikum, a performing whale at Orlando SeaWorld that kills several people while in captivity. Blackfish provides, of course, shocking details about the sea park industry and contributed to legislation throughout the U.S. concerning marine mammals' well-being. To learn more about Blackfish and the festival itself, we're honored to have in our studio the producer of Blackfish, Manny Oteza. Hi, Manny. Thank you Hi, for joining thank us. Hi, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And by you. journalist Aneta Khitouv, our environmental specialist, Good of morning. course. Thank you both uh, for joining us. Many, of course, uh, you know, bringing your movie, your film over here to Israel, where we don't have a sea world and we're right. not really connected to that industry, is probably groundbreaking for many of us Israelis who don't even know the behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, we were a very surprised, um, not just Israel, but even around the world where there are no marine parks, that the movie, you know, has been taken by so many people that their interest in you know marine uh, animals in captivity especially orca whales so we're very happy that the message of the movie is all over the world, especially here in Israel. Right. So, and the movie did uh, lead to legislation in the United States. Just take us to the years and days uh, preceding the movie. What was the situation like then, and, and how has it changed because of the film? Um, I mean, uh, right now it hasn't changed too much because SeaWorld has always been fighting. You know that they have accused our film full of um, lies and untruths. Um, so we're still in the fight to, you know, um, talk about uh, how wrong uh, animals in captivity are. Mm -hmm. I mean, so far with the movie, a lot of support from the public. Their attendance has gone down right. 13 percent. Wow. And even their stock prices has also gone down. So definitely, you know, the film has made, you know, an uh, impact on them and their bottom line, even though they still don't want to admit that the film has done anything, you know, right. to affect and them. And they keep it open purely out of financial uh, 
uh, interest or is there actual uh, ideology behind it that we people need to see whales and orcas and so forth and dolphins in caged uh, areas? Well, we've learned, and this is where the filmmaker, uh, the director, Gabriella, and myself, we came into this knowing nothing about um, animals, dolphins, in captivity. And this is where we've learned that you can see them in the wild. Mm -hmm. And, you know, especially whales, and you see how many miles they can swim, but where now they're just stuck in a bathtub, basically. And I think there's a certain point where we have said that, you know, we have um, promoted the idea of sea pens, where the whales can at least, almost in a way, retire. Right. But still have the human contact, you know, for their care. Um, and we feel that might be something where kids and their, you know, the, the goers would still go see the whales in these parks. But so far, you know, SeaWorld has not, has you know, not made any done changes. anything. Yeah. Well, how do they explain, uh, or, or, or are, they, are they even trying to explain uh, the, the killing or, or the event that sparked off uh, uh, the, the film, of course, when a trainer was killed and several other people were killed by uh, Tilikum? They've never really explained. I mean, it's one of those where... They blame it on... The, the, like, first they had blame it on her, herself, right. and her ponytail. And, you know, the other... Um, killings that the whale had done, th they don't explain it. Or mm -hmm. it's one of those where at first we had no clue that the whale had killed two other people kind of thing. So I think they try to do their, um, the way they word things so it's the mis misinformation. And that's the thing we had learned that the information they give is misinformation right. because at this point we have always felt, you know, growing up like, oh, they're the experts in this field. Right. And the more we learn the more we find out, oh, some of their information are half-truths and all that kind of stuff from the dorsal fin of the whale, you know, collapse and then the whole swimming for hundreds of miles and how they're a whole a family pod where they're thinking if they're just brought together from different families that they're all going to be, you get know, along. happy. Yeah. yeah and so. uh, in the trailer, I think uh, one of the strongest lines is perhaps... Uh, I forget who says this, uh, but says, you know, if you were in a bathtub for 40 somewhat mm -hmm. years, wouldn't you also, uh, you know, go right. crazy? Yeah. <laughs> is, yeah. Is, that the, is that the underlying uh, accusation here, that because they're trapped in, thus... Uh, well, that's kind of the them? premise we were bringing up, especially with, you know, we have our scientist in the movie explaining, mm -hmm. you know, how smart these creatures are. Right. And that there's a certain point where here's what their life is in the wild, but now they're just trapped in a bathtub. At what point, you know, does that drive you crazy? Right. And, you know, so th that's kind of the you know, things that are, is our premise that we try to lay out in the film. We're going to speak uh, soon with Nette about other films that uh, speak about environmental concerns and, and uh, issues. But, you know, the, I guess the, the average citizen wouldn't say that environmental documentaries are the first ones to, to hit the headlines and so right. forth the way. Did it surprise you, the success of Blackfish? Yes. I mean, our goal was really just making a good movie and hoping someone will watch it. And definitely um, the director, Gabrielle Copperthwaite, the intention was always to, here's all the facts. It wasn't about accusing SeaWorld or picking sides, it was more like, here's the information we had learned. Right. And that you don't know. That we didn't know, yeah. and then it's really for the audience to decide after the movie's over, you know, which side would you want to be on. And I think that's what made the film work, because it reached out to, you know, just the regular people that either they went as a kid, they're right. now parents now taking their kids possibly to go there for vacation, where I think we've reached that general public instead of just the environmental or animal groups that were, of course, been interested in and, the film. And, of course, the incredible footage, the horrible footage uh, of, yes, of, of being, yeah. people don't even realize how these orcas are brought to SeaWorld itself. Right, yeah. No, yeah, it was, you know, the hunting footage that, you know, even though, like, an accusation from SeaWorld, oh, we don't do that, you know, right. anymore, or that's old footage, but a lot of people had never seen that footage before. Was it before. easy access? As a producer, were you able to easily access this It footage? took a while yeah. to find the stuff, and in the U.S., we use the Freedom of Information Act mm -hmm. to acquire a lot of the footage, but it does take a lot of persistence to get it. Undercover I mean, cameras and so forth? Well, we never used undercover cameras. Okay. I mean, it was more that we did shoot inside, you know, with just our regular cameras and all that. So I'd say a lot of um, using the Freedom Information Act, we're able to get some of that footage because everyone has cameras right. at the park. So it was just trying to find all those people and the information that was already at the OSHA court um, case where we, you know, were able to get some of the footage, but it did take a long 
time what, to was do. Was a film uh, attempted uh, by others to halt its production, halt its release because of because they knew what the message would be? No, because they, I think. Nobody realized. At that time, no one took us really seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did ask for interviews with SeaWorld repeatedly, even to the point of submitting questions and all that, but they still had refused. But I don't think, even when we were at the Sundance Film Festival, I don't think we were still taken seriously. Only until we got our film release um, in, in the U.S. did they now really start their promotional right. PR attacks on the film. Well, it's definitely something that uh, can and will go viral, I right. think, uh, worldwide. <laughs> they, they don't have much of a choice uh, today. Netta, uh, this, is, of course, is uh, maybe the headline of uh, environmental films. Does it have been other films that will be shown yes. at this year's festival? Yes, this is a pretty amazing festival. It, uh, it goes up every year in different places all around the country, also in the periphery, not only in Tel Aviv and Jaffa. This year it is focused on... Uh, the oceans mm -hmm. and um, you know mammals there fish uh, whatever is in there and it's uh, they're really really good films uh, this is of course the highlight of the festival but there is another film called turtle the mm -hmm. amazing journey it's really the most beautiful film I'm sorry <laughs> for that <laughs> uh, really footage wise it's beautiful it follows a turtle a female turtle from her you know hatching from the egg and yeah. then her whole journey through the ocean and you know how and then when she oh, becomes wow. a mother it's really beautiful it's like um, you know finding Nemo but real in real life it's very very nice and I recommend it a lot and then there are other two very sad films. Uh, one of them is uh, Extinction Soup, uh, mm -hmm. which is about the shark fin soup, uh, which is very popular in Asia. We don't right. know it here. It's not very popular here. And also in the States, I think it's not very popular. But in Asia, it's a big, thing. a big thing. Yeah. And um, uh, the film was uh, also a uh, crowdsourcing. This is how they got the funding. So right. it's pretty exciting. And yeah, there are really harsh footage there. You know, you think shark is a fish. and you won't, you know, feel very sorry as if it was a dog or something, but you do. You really, you know, you, of course. Yeah, and the way, the way they're captured and, yes. and the way they're uh, made into. Uh, yeah, there's horrible footage, like sad footage, good cinematically speaking, but very sad uh, humanly speaking, and. Um, and this was crowdfunded uh, mostly, uh, and this goes back to my first question, it's mostly uh, funded and, and followed by animal rights activists, yes. but, but then it, when it hits the screens, it really touches the wider yeah. population. It's not like a yeah. niche movie anymore. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's really just getting people to see yeah. it. Yeah. Blackfish is also very surprising in that sense because Blackfish is a sad film. I, I was crying the whole time, and right. then yes, yeah. 48 hours <laughs> later, whenever I you know remember it, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So and so people going to watch it, you know, on their own will, yes. <laughs> in cinema, it's really surprising, and you know, it it makes me optimistic, you know, that people really want to know what's going on, and they're curious, even though it's sad. You know, and it's not only an ideology based, uh, you know, we're not just going yeah. because we're we're right, we're animal rights, but we're going because yeah. this is an un injustice that's yeah. being done. right, yeah. It's a very good film. There is a really Thank good you. story in it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it makes it, you know, it makes it a good film to watch. Another uh, uh, European uh, bluefin tuna. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's called um, I remember. The Last Catch. Yeah, yeah, The Last Catch, and it's about the tuna craze and, uh, and crave uh, of, you know, the whole world. The whole we world, all yeah. eat those uh, canned tuna. We all eat sandwich tuna. And uh, we pay a really, really big price for that because it's not only the tuna that are going extinct, it's the whole environment because, you know, there is a food chain. And uh, this guy that you see here now, uh, he's the main character in this mm -hmm. uh, documentary. And he was a tuna fisherman. And he just takes you hand by hand. This is how you feel as a, you know, and when you watch it, he takes you hand by hand and show you, shows you the whole process of how you catch it. And this is also interesting. This is a fisherman and his son, and they are trying to actually, you know, go by the law and not, you know, violate the law and go with the regulation. And they're the only ones. Uh -huh. Like all the rest are because just because there's no supervision, yeah, there's, there's no, no reg regulatory yeah, nothing. Uh, yeah, they say even if we'll stop fishing for three months, so they will be able to reproduce and. You know, and you know heal the community it will be better for all of us right. we have more fish but no one follows the rule and but no. it's also because of the demand of the population yes. the mm -hmm. tuna is on demand as you said yes and it's not only canned tuna it's also tuna yeah sushi tuna, sushi and, so, tuna and so yeah. forth yeah and they say there that the tuna becomes smaller and smaller with 
you know, with each year and less and less and uh, healthy yeah. and so forth. Yeah, really sad movies. <laughs> and in general, animals in captivity is something yes. that we're only getting aware of uh, yeah. recently yeah. because um, of these films. Yeah, right. SeaWorld, for example, it's a proper circus. And today, you know, most of the people won't think to go to a circus to see, to watch a, you know, elephant jump over a hula hoop. Uh, but you know, we do go to these places because we're not very close or yet mm -hmm. not close to sea mammals, I guess, or to, you know, ocean animals, but it's a circus. They, they do tricks for us and entertain us in a way. Yeah, and you unnatural. can't even say that it's conservation, that there is a, any, you know, basis of conservation as, like, for example, zoos are claiming. Right. Yeah. And are zoos, are in, ter in terms of environmentalists, uh, conserving these animals? Um, not really. Not really. That's a whole other... <laughs> no, uh, yeah, that's that too. They're saying that it's education and conservation. We can claim both are not right. And in the case of SeaWorld and all these uh, sea parks, they say that you know they, they can't even claim the conservation. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Should humans uh, completely uh, disconnect from... Is there a way that humans can uh, interact with animals? Scuba diving, whale yeah. watching, are those things that are... Uh, harmful to the industry and they're less harmful than you know cap you know putting but them still. in captivity uh, still yeah I, I would recommend yeah doing that in a very natural environment you're a scuba diver you I know, know that's why I'm asking right. I'm trying to make sure that I'm uh, I want to be okay now <laughs> yeah the last scene of blackfish it's not a spoiler the last scene of right. blackfish all the trainers the ex trainer who left and now they are speaking about right. what's going on there they're going to watch the orcas in in wild and it's really really exciting and emotional because you know, they see how they're supposed to live, and this is, it's really a beautiful scene. And they are yeah. all, you know, crying and very emotional, and this is how it's supposed to be. Yeah. Where do you think, uh, Manny, that this uh, movie can take uh, not only legislation, but worldwide populations? Is this something that can move people to act differently, or is this uh, simply like the tip of the iceberg? I think it's starting to make that movement. I mean, our goal, you know, with making the movie is also that people are now talking about right. this where before no one was discussing this topic. And, you know, we have, you know, from kids not wanting to take field trips to SeaWorld, and, you know, we had bands not wanting to perform. Oh, yeah. So there, and the legislation that right. you have mentioned. And the Nemo sequence. Oh, yes, and then uh, the Dory, the, the Finding Nemo se uh, sequel, right. where they were changing the ending based on what they had learned from Blackfish. So I think it's going to be an ongoing topic for a while. And we hope, you know, at least we know now, at least the public is conscious of what's happening. We're not sure yet what SeaWorld will do, well, but the now talking. If financial impact does, uh, it's almost like sanctions, you know, when we put it in diplomacy. Right. If uh, people aren't going to SeaWorld, they are going to have to change their ways. Exactly. And that's kind of what, down. what I've always said in uh, interviews. Mm -hmm. Just people go, well, what can we do? And it's the simple thing of just don't buy a ticket. You yeah. know, that will eventually make changes, hopefully, yeah. Well, Manny Oteza, thank you for joining us. Uh, good luck here in Tel Aviv at thank the you. Cinema. I'm sure uh, the Israelis will flock to see Blackfish. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, thank you, thank of you. course. And after the break, we're going to speak with Zazie de Parisa, iconic actress, who's holding a master class at Tel Aviv's LGBT film festival, lots of film festivals around Israel this weekend. But first, let's hear some more of this morning's headlines. annual international LGBT film festival which is opening tomorrow and by offering these LGBT oriented films with no prior Israeli distribution the festival really does aim to empower tolerance and pluralism in Israeli society and one of this year's most notable guests is Zazie de Perry who is scheduled to give a master class and present her work on stage and film this exclusive TLV Fest event marks Zazie's first visit to Israel in decades, and I'm thrilled now to have the actress and singer in our studio. Good morning, Zazie. Good morning. In decades? When's the last time you were in Israel? <laughs> well, um, what can I say? I don't know anymore. I, I don't know. I you don't know. know. Anything's changed uh, since you've last been here? Everything changed. Yeah. I changed. You changed. Everybody changed, of well, course. And Tel Aviv God. changed. I mean, now Tel Aviv, uh, we're, we're in the beginning of uh, the Gay Pride Month and Gay Pride Week. And I know we've that. just uh, spoken how Tel Aviv 
constantly is reaching the top 10 lists of the gay spot destinations and yeah. LGBT spot destinations. Of course, but I tell you something, because the gay people and the lesbians are those people who knows everything about love. Mm -hmm. And love is the way to go to peace. Mm. So that's those are the people who just want to be accepted like they are right. because of their loving. And, and that's why Tel Aviv is perhaps a hot spot. And you're coming from France, a place where, is it a place of love? And, and can, well, can we say it's a gay hot spot, LGBT hot spot? I don't know if it's exactly a GBT, but uh, it's uh, Paris, the, the city, city of, of love, love anyway. <laughs> but I'm not living in Paris, I'm living in Berlin, in mm. Germany. So, which is definitely a city of love. <laughs> which is definitely something else, but uh, you find love everywhere if you are looking for, if you open nice. the doors and the windows. Where, and where you have to go search for it and then you'll find it. That's uh, it. The LGBT uh, film festival uh, in Tel Aviv is, is not something, uh, uh, it's relatively new, it's only from 2006, but since it started, it's been growing every year. Nine years now. Nine years now, bringing in international audiences as well. Yeah. It's not only about, not for the Tel Aviv uh, population Absolutely. itself. Absolutely. Open the boards. Open the boards and Yair Hochner do that. Mm -hmm. I met him sometimes in Berlin and I know that he tries always to open the doors. And uh, that's why this festival in Tel Aviv is so important and has such a color. Why does the LGBT community, though, need its own festival? And, and, and does it? Does it show d films that cannot be shown in the other big film festivals around the world, in, in Cannes, sure. in Sundance, and, and I'll Venice? I'll tell you something. Everybody is inspired mm -hmm. of us. Mm -hmm. And all the biggest ones, Fellini, Visconti, Fassbinder, even Almodovar, was discovered in Berlin mm. by the Teddy Awards. So, you know... And uh, I would tell you something, all mostly m the main actors, hetero actors, who plays transsexuals, like Tutsi or uh, Priscilla, whatever, they all win an Oscar. Right. So we inspire so many people. Meaning it's the, this kind of, the, this genre of film has been around for ages, but only now, perhaps in recent years, in the last nine years here in Tel Aviv, have we given it a name. We give it a name because we are obliged to give it a name, because mm -hmm. we are still taboo, you know. Everything, how can I say it? It's a taboo. It's a taboo. It's yeah. a taboo. So, but now, uh, no, no, no longer. Or maybe it's still I mean, is. It's still a big taboo. Look, uh, I don't want to tell you in Russia or in Africa, uh, if you m make a map, of the whole world, mm -hmm. and you see all the countries where uh, transgenders, uh, homophobia uh, is so enormous, mm -hmm. people are still dying for that. Mm -hmm. That's why I go on the barricade and say, no, not with us, not right. with me. And, and, that, and this is why, uh, of course, it, maybe you do need your, the, own, the own film festival to at least highlight. At the beginning, we need that. Any uh, films that are going to be uh, shown this year that you especially uh, want to... Uh, I don't about? want to talk about that because it's uh, just new. And uh, I like the surprise. That's why I'm in the jury. I just want to be surprised. I love movie, but I love to be the first one to see it like a virgin. Okay, I, that, so. that, that's a good enough answer for me. You're going to be uh, giving a master class uh, yes. uh, in front of film students who are probably eager to hear what you have to say. Give us a little, a little trailer of what you're going to be uh, doing. I will, I will tell a lot about my life. Mm -hmm. So this is the master class because um, I will tell them how it started, how it is to be an actress mm -hmm. just in normal life, because I'm not playing in uh, homosexual lesbian theaters, you know, right. just so to be accepted it takes such a long time. And at the beginning, uh, when I started with the theater in Germany, there was uh, the place for the women and the place for the men. And when I came, they didn't know how to take my measures mm -hmm. uh, by the women, not by the men. The men didn't want because no, the women. So it was such a thing. I opened so many doors. Right. And I will tell how it works. Meaning that if you uh, had started today, it would be a different reality completely? It's so easy now. It could so be easy. so easy. Yeah. Look at Conchita Wurst, mm -hmm. and we have in Israel Dana International. Right. I mean, all my sisters and brothers like uh, Coxinelle and Amanda Lear and even David Bowie, all those sisters and brothers opened a lot of doors. And now the next generation, my children's, has it much more easier for them. They can even wear a bod and be a woman, you know, if they want. Right. Or not, if they don't want. It, yeah. there, less rules. Were you were doors closed in your face um, many times before you were able oh, to yeah. open them? Yes. Not oh. only the door, the doors first and then the windows. So just <laughs> you, you sticked in your own juice. Right. So it was horrible. So, so how did you I, convince uh, producers and, and uh, directors and so forth that they should look at you as an, an actress and not, you know, put you in a category of male, female or so forth? 
You know, it will sound maybe very, very pretentious, but there's only one word mm -hmm. who opened all the doors, and it's called talent. And when you have it, one day it will be shown. It and comes people, out. Are, people are educated enough to see the talent and not look at you as, you know, as... as they can look at me as they want, mm -hmm. but if they're touched, if their heart is touched, then I did my job. Right. Well, you've definitely made your mark on uh, the film industry and so forth. Now, by spreading your message and telling your story, yeah. you're, you're doing another job. You're educating. Sure. But that's what I do all the time. I always, I, I always was a, a, a fighter, a fighter against homophobia and against everything who is un, un, unright in this world. I can't support it. Mm -hmm. So I go on the barricades and I, I, I fight for the rights. For everybody writes. Right. Don't forget, I come from France. Liberté, égalité, fraternité. It's not only words. It's right. things that we have to put together. And you're in Hebrew. You will say, Evenu shalom right. aleichem. We, we brought peace upon you. Right. Yes. So it's not just a word, you know, a uh, word. No, it's not a word. Shalom is something very important. And in Israel, when you say hello to somebody, you say shalom. It means peace on you. Right. Peace on you. So what, what's the next uh, step in terms of, will, will you go to Russia, will you go to those places in Africa that are, that are not uh, letting uh, LGBT uh, communities thrive? I mean, I'm not a hero. I'm not going to go there to be killed. I'm sure a lot of people will be. No, that's they not think that. you are here. No, no, not that. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to the festival. I go in the way where I work. I'm an actress. I'm a singer. So I sing in each of my concerts. Uh -huh. The end of the concert is, Evenu Shalom Alechem. Because it doesn't matter if it's Paris or Germany or whatever, that's what I love to sing. And I have of course, a big repertoire about love, about nice texts, and I have the chance to work in the movie or the theaters and uh, to have an audience. And I hear you integrate a lot of, uh, just by this conversation, Hebrew and Judaism in your work as well. Yes, yes, yes. There, and th that's okay with the religious uh, community and so forth? And no boards. Well, if they don't have a <laughs> problem with me, I don't have a problem with them. The, they can believe in what they want, darling, why not? Yes. Let them believe. But don't live in lit and let, let live in no, peace. Believe in peace, yes. Believe in peace, and nice. if you believe in peace, you believe that you are here for love. Well, That's welcome back to Israel after many uh, years of not coming, uh, not being here, and, and <clears throat> I hope that Tel Aviv is not the only hotspot for gays and uh, LGBT community. It's the entire Israel, and I hope it does spread. It doesn't become only. There are much more uh, uh, homosexual and lesbian that we think, right. and uh, this all those people who are suffering because they can't open themselves. So thanks God there is this kind of, thanks God not, thanks uh, the Republic and, and everything yeah. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> the Republic. <laughs> that there is this kind of so festival. So French, you see in yes. the end you're very French. Yes, yes. <laughs> so thank you Merci for joining so us. Uh, stay with us here, this is right next to me on my uh, left, left. <laughs> depending <laughs> left, who's, who's right. looking, is Anthony <laughs> Grant, who you're here with What's Hot on the Web right now. Yeah, well, uh, hello again, and um, speaking of, of heat, internet heat, I, ha I hate to say it, but I love to say it because it's all about Rihanna. Oh, wow. Yeah, what, what is she doing Causing now? heat in, in various, various forms. In terms um, of? In terms of everything. You know, it was Monday night that she got the uh, CFDA Fashion Award in New York. From and, the one and only Anna, Anna Wintour. Wintour wow. uh, which was, uh, Vogue was all over that, of course. We had a video, which we can't see, of some imagined texting between Anna Wintour and Rihanna. Nice. We don't have that, but she did do her spin on the twerk. Who, okay, let me see that. Yeah. Let's see that. Come on! Wait till you're public! Now, you know, I am so a proud member of her Navy. Uh, Navy. <laughs> so I, the thing is, the dress, very classy, caused a lot of controversy because there was some sheer issues going on. Well, but, she likes that part. But, yeah. you know, the thing is that... Um, she wore a fur. I'm sorry. I yeah. think it's fake. I'm sure it's not. <laughs> I, I can tell oh, okay. you it's not. We're, we're going to have a Rihanna smackdown. Yeah, here. good. I There's think, someone finally I, I, giving you some kind of, you know, contra I will here. check with her hairstylist, Youssef, who filmed that video. Right. Um, and uh, her, I'll check with Anna. I'll call Anna. And yeah. see. Hopefully it was fake so for her. So she was I don't twerking know, after she received the th prize? It was ab she was happy. She got the prize. So she was, you know, you know, dancing. And, and she's OK with the, the leakage of this uh, footage? I think she's okay with the leakage of the footage. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, and it's it's all good PR for her. At the same, I think just a few days after she jetted off to Paris mm -hmm. to unveil her new fragrance called Rogue. Okay. And she was yeah. naked in Louis. 
She, where, where was she naked? <laughs> naked in a in a newspaper. Oh, a Louis, French called I, Louis. Tastefully naked. And she was. Uh, I, I, tastefully, tastefully. I, you call it tastefully. Okay. I, 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 I'm a staunch I defender it, of the natural. She was like a battle. I'm so but, excited. But uh, in this picture, uh, uh, in uh, this, uh, as she was promoting her perfume, she looked very uh, elegant. Um, well. with her uh, very sort of spaceship esque, I don't know, get up that she has there. Yeah, she does look a little like an astronaut. A little she? bit, a little, a little astral. <laughs> um, now there's some controversy because the poster that shows her promoting it has been actually uh, pulled from various places because it's apparently uh, a little bit too, too provocative for some audiences, even though she is clothed in it. But you know, it's Rihanna, so you just never know what to expect. Wow. Yeah, well, and speaking okay. of Speaking of Rogue. From classy to trashy and back to classy and back to trashy. And back to, to Sarah Palin. Oh, back because, to trashy. Because, you know, the, perfume, the yeah. perfume is called Rogue, and I thought, who else has gone Rogue? Sarah Palin. And, of course, Sarah Palin <laughs> is the first person to weigh in on the Bo Bergdahl controversy, the so-called POW who right. actually seems like he deserted and wanted to become a jihadist, we learned this morning. Right. But Sarah Palin says, if you forgot how to speak English, Unlike Ooh. John McCain, go get Rosetta Stone and relearn. Oh, so my God. she's all over it. It's you know, it's maybe too soon to joke about this because the scandal is like hourly. We're getting new headlines. Right. But Sarah but Palin, of Sarah course, Palin, is slamming I mean, him. Mm. You could say, you know, go go look at a map first and learn your geography. She before knows you where reading. Alaska is. <laughs> Russia's neighbor. <laughs> that's, she, Russia's neighbor. Yeah. yeah, so oh, she's wow. she, she's weighing in, and that's why I want to take it back to the theater. Okay. Because Cindy Adams, of course, famous uh, Page Six columnist, has reminded us all that it's 50-year anniversary of Fiddler on the Roof. 50 which, years of Tuvia. Uh, if I was a rich man. man. Oh. And did you know, <laughs> she talked to Topol, uh, who, of course, made the role famous, right. who said that when he performed in Hebrew, he had to change if I were a rich man to if I were a Rothschild. Because he said that's what the name that in Israel they yeah, yeah, associated with the wealth, you know. The, the song "If I Were a Rich Man." How would it sound though if you sang it as if I, "If I Were a Rich Man"? If I Were a Rich Man, that's why we're not in Broadway and he is. Yeah, I can't believe I just did that right now. All right, it's a Friday, <laughs> so I'm allowed to karaoke Absolutely. myself through Fiddler in the Room. <laughs> and um, you know, we are a morning show. And that's why when I found out about these bacon lollipops, I got excited. Uh, yeah. We went from the Israeli version of Fiddler on the Roof to bacon lollipops. We I don't did. know who's going to. Yes, it's, it happens on a shishi yeah. on a Friday. Um, so what are these bacon apparently lollipops? Apparently, it's a popular um, uh, food I, you can get as, as a set, like um, sort of like a, an omelet flavored um, uh, lollipop, uh, bacon, and it's like $7.99. It was picked up on some website called Food Beast. I, I don't see. know if we have an image of it, but. Uh, it's, it, uh, it it's, sounds like a dietary, you know, like, you know, for a lot of people sugar. that don't want to eat the actual bacon, they'll just like lick the bacon. Just to just have like a, 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 a flavor of... I have uh, to say, it's not for me. I'd rather the real deal. Mm. <laughs> Marshmallow with omelette? Yeah. Strange. Mm. It's very strange. A little bit odd, perhaps. Um, <laughs> speaking of... Um, of restaurants, I went to a very trendy one last night in Tel Aviv. Okay. Yeah, maybe you've heard of it. It's called Bindella. I have heard of it. Of and course. you told me about it. Oh. Um, but that's Oops. now yeah. Bindella. <laughs> it reminded me. I saw this uh, a piece in GrubStreet.com about um, crazy restaurant names. Um, and uh, which is like this growing phenomenon in New York. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned Bendella because it's actually a family name of, of a Swiss family. Right. And it's a great sort of Swiss Italian restaurant. Um, and it's an organically sourced name. But there's this growing trend afoot, especially in Manhattan, of weird restaurant names that actually make no sense. Right. And so uh, GrubStreet.com was talking about the phenomenon of why it's happening. And, and they mentioned a restaurant in Copenhagen called Noma. Which is right. very, which is considered to it's be like, like the, the world, one of the fanciest yeah. restaurants in the world right now, one of the most um, talked about. Mm -hmm. And so restaurateurs are trying to cash in on that sound of like the noma and make it like cafe blah blah or yeah. whatever. <laughs> Anything. Meaning that, it has no actual meaning. Exactly. Meaning it has. Uh, Me, that right. Was a good one. Yeah. I mean, it's like <laughs> the, like the less meaning it has, the trendier it becomes, and the harder it is to get a table. Nice. Yeah, you know, and then the people, said, you know, and you want to be where Kim Kardashian is having her stew. And that know? was Anthony Grant's philosophy. Thank on you for that on yes. restaurants. Anthony Grant, uh, Grant, thank you for joining thank us. You. Have a great weekend, Zazie Dib Thank you thank for joining you. us. Have a great weekend here in Tel Aviv. And that's it for us this morning. You can visit us on our website, i24news.tv, or, of course, on our Facebook page. And don't forget to join us again on Monday morning to start your day every day. I'm Yael Listener-Levy. Next up are the headlines.